Chapter 1 Brody Finnegan pounded a nail into the wood for the fence he was building around the grazing land for his cattle. He'd been letting them free range for too long, and it was time for them to be penned up. With the new barbed wire that had come out a few years ago, he'd be able to do it beautifully. He'd lost a few too many cattle over the years to various critters and sometimes to unscrupulous ranchers in the vicinity. When he finished, he stood and looked around him at the vast Montana prairie he called home. He knew someday his sons would be ranching here and their sons after them. He was building a legacy, and he was ready to have the sons to go with it. He'd heard a lot about mail-order brides lately, some of them coming from as far as New York City. He'd seen an ad in the store in Mangled Stump for a mail-order bride service back east operating out of Maine or Massachusetts or someplace like that. He'd write a letter tonight and take it into town with him when he went for supplies. He wanted a sweet girl who could cook, clean, and have babies. What else was necessary in a bride? Yes, sir, he'd have himself a bride soon. Asterisk. Esther Carruthers hurried into the house after her all-day shopping spree. Planning a wedding and buying a trousseau was hard work. She dropped her bags at the base of the stairs and walked into the parlor, expecting her mother and younger sister, Coral, to be waiting for her. She wasn't disappointed. Oh, I found the most beautiful hat today. It was lavender and had little flowers around the brim. I bought it for the wedding. It will go with my dress perfectly. Her mother looked at her with eyes filled with unshed tears. You'll have to return it. Esther stared at her mother with shock. Return it? Why would I do that? Because we haven't the money to pay for it. Her mother patted the spot beside her on the sofa. Sit and talk with me for a moment. Esther looked back and forth between her younger sister and her mother. What's going on here? Why wouldn't I have money to pay for it? Even if father can't afford it, and we all know he can, then Jeremiah will happily pay for one hat. It's only a month before the wedding, and he'll be taking over all my expenses then anyway. She moved over to sit beside her mother. I'm not sure what the worry is, mother, but everything's going to be wonderful. Her mother buried her face in her hands and sobbed, obviously overcome with emotion. Esther shook her head at her sister, Coral. Their mother had been very emotional since her engagement three months before. Coral, a year younger than Esther, leaned forward in her chair, which was perpendicular to the sofa Esther shared with mother. The constable came while you were out shopping. Father's been arrested. She raised her voice to talk over the wailing coming from their mother. He's been embezzling from the bank for years. Esther's eyes widened in shock. Embezzling? Father? Their father was the very picture of a state banker. Even the way he breathed was boring in Esther's mind. That's not possible. Coral nodded. Apparently it is. Jeremiah is the one who caught him, and he reported it to his father. Jeremiah was the son of the owner of the bank where their father had worked for as long as either of the girls could remember. But, Jeremiah wouldn't report father. He did. Father's in jail. Esther rubbed her temples, trying to wrap her mind around the situation. I need to go see Jeremiah. Surely once she talked to him, he'd tell her it had all been a mistake, and it could be cleared up quickly and easily. Her father wouldn't do something so dastardly. Coral stood and walked across the room, picking up a single folded piece of paper with Esther's name written in neat penmanship on the outside. She handed it to her sister, a pitying look on her face. Esther stared down at Jeremiah's handwriting. There. See? I'm sure everything will be fine after I read this. He'll tell me that it's all some sort of sick joke. Normally Jeremiah didn't believe in playing jokes on people, but she was his future wife. Maybe he was making an exception for some reason. She'd tell him she didn't like it, and she was sure he'd stop. She opened the letter and scanned the words quickly, her face losing color with each word she read. 
Esther. I regret to inform you that due to the events of this very trying day, I must call off our engagement. You must see that it simply wouldn't do for a man of my stature to be married to the daughter of a criminal. You may keep the ring, but I will not be paying any of the bills you are racking up about town. I'm sure you understand my predicament. It may be best if you were to go away somewhere so we wouldn't have to have that awkward moment where my future wife will run into you, and neither of you will know what to say. I wish you the best. Jeremiah. Esther crumpled the note in her hand, not quite believing what she'd read. Jeremiah wouldn't just call off their engagement. They were in love. Why, she'd allowed him to kiss her on numerous occasions. Surely he would realize the need for them to marry after that. A lady didn't go about town kissing just anyone. She stood and walked to the door. I'm going to his house to talk to him. I can't let it end this way. She looked at Coral. Would you accompany me? Or should I call for Nora? Nora had been the girl's maid for more than ten years, and she would happily go with Esther, but Esther would prefer the support of her sister for this meeting. Nora's gone, Coral told her. All of the servants left. They're taking all of our furniture tomorrow. We have nothing. We'll be allowed to keep most of our clothes, but nothing of any value at all. But, Nora's been with us for ten years. She wouldn't just leave. Coral had always been the more practical of the two. Of course she would. We can no longer pay her. She has to go to someone who can. Well, I won't hire her back when I marry Jeremiah next month. I can't believe she wouldn't wait just one month. Esther shook her head. She couldn't believe Nora, of all the servants, would get so uppity about something like that. Well, I guess you'll need to be the one to walk with me to see Jeremiah then. Coral looked like she wanted to argue, but she nodded. All right. Let's go see him. Esther linked her arm with Coral's and hurried down the street and over to the next. She and Jeremiah had been raised in the same neighborhood and had even gone to the same school. She'd known him her whole life, and they'd loved one another since she'd first discovered that boys were for more than tormenting girls. When they reached Jeremiah's house, she rapped on the door, her hands behind her back as she waited. She'd never actually gone to his house this way before, but she didn't see anything wrong with her behavior. She was engaged to marry the man. Jeremiah himself came to the door, frowning at Esther. He stepped outside and closed the door behind him, looking around as if to see if anyone was watching them. Why are you here? Didn't you get my note? Yes, of course. That's why I'm here. I don't understand. Why would you accuse my father of stealing? I didn't just accuse him. I caught him red-handed. His hand was in the money drawer, with no customers around, and then I saw him make a note. I watched, and he'd moved money from one account to another, with no reason or permission. But we love each other. I can't believe you'd call off the wedding. Jeremiah laughed. Oh, Esther. I can't marry a woman who's been shamed the way your family has. I'll marry someone more befitting my station in life. Don't you have relatives you can go live with? Esther frowned. But you told me just last night that you love me, and you can't wait for us to have children together. I'm still willing to have children with you, Esther. I'll set you up in a house on the outskirts of town, and I'll visit you when I'm interested. Visit me? But we're marrying, aren't we? Jeremiah shook his head. No, we're not. We're not marrying. In fact, if you don't want to be my mistress, then I don't plan to see you again. His eyes were cold as they met hers. Esther's eyes widened with shock. Your mistress? Well, I never. He shrugged. That's okay. I can teach you. Esther looked at Coral, as if begging for help, and then she straightened her spine, her eyes meeting his. Goodbye, Jeremiah. I hope your future wife is cross-eyed and your children are all born demented. 
She turned and walked away from the house, aware that her sister was following her. When they reached the street, Coral started laughing. I can't believe you said that to him. Esther glared at her sister for a moment, before she saw the humor of the situation. He deserved it. She stood there for a moment, struggling to come to grips her new circumstances. What do we do now? She knew Coral would have figured something out, because she always did. Coral was good at working through situations. Coral took a deep breath. I've had longer to think about this than you have, and I think I have a plan. Enlighten me, sister dear. What's your plan? You'll have to become a mail-order bride. There's an ad in the back of the mercantile. It's always there. It says to go to a house a couple of blocks from here and talk to Elizabeth Miller. I'm too young. She only takes brides older than 18. So what will you do? And mother? What's to become of mother? Esther certainly didn't want to be burdened with their mother, because she'd been a recluse for years. She'd only left the house a few times, and then only because she'd been forced to. Coral shook her head. Mother will move in with her parents. She's disgraced, and they live in the country outside of Boston. She can hide away there. She told me to go with her, but I'm not going to hide away in the country. I'm ready for adventure. So what's your plan? Esther had no idea what her sister was thinking, but she would love to know. I'm going with you. I'll find a husband out west. But, what if I don't marry someone who's willing to have my sister come along? Coral shrugged. We won't tell him. I'll just come. It'll be fine. Esther frowned at the idea, but she finally nodded. I need you to be with me. I can't go out west by myself and marry a stranger. I'll need you by my side. Let's go see Miss Miller then. Coral linked arms with her sister once again, and they walked the two blocks to the street where Miss Miller lived, stopping in front of a huge house. Esther knocked on the door, her face neutral. It was hard to swallow her pride enough to become a mail-order bride. How could anyone do that? The door was opened by a tall, blonde man in a suit. May I help you? Esther nodded. I'm here to see Miss Miller. I'm going to be a mail-order bride. The man seemed to be trying not to smile. I see. Is Miss Miller expecting you? No, she's not. Is that a problem? He shook his head. No, of course not. Follow me. He led the two sisters down a long hallway to a room at the very back of the house off to the left. Miss Miller? There are two young ladies here to see you. One of them is going to be a mail-order bride. A look passed between the two that made Esther wonder if there was a romance blossoming. Miss Miller, I'm Esther Carruthers. I'm here to talk to you about being a mail-order bride. This is my sister Coral. She's only 17, but she would be a mail-order bride if you'd let her. Miss Miller smiled. Please, call me Elizabeth. She stood and waved them both toward the sofa, before taking her chair in front of her desk again. The desk was piled full of papers. When will you be 18, Miss Carruthers? Coral sat down and gave her attention to Elizabeth. Not for three more months. In November. I see. Come see me in November, and we'll find you a husband as well. I appreciate the offer. I believe I'll have moved on by then, Coral said, telling as much of the truth as she cared to tell. I see, Elizabeth said. She didn't of course, but that didn't seem to matter a lot. Elizabeth smiled at Esther. You want to be a mail-order bride? No, not really. Esther spread her hands palms up. I was engaged to be married until earlier today. Our father was caught shall we say misbehaving at his workplace? He is now behind bars. My fiancé decided it was a good time to break off our engagement. Elizabeth blinked a couple of times. Obviously that wasn't a story she heard every day. 
so you're wanting to leave town to get away from him? Esther nodded. And I need to marry. It's time. Elizabeth smiled. All right. We'll make this happen. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been trained to be a good wife. I met my fiancé in school, and I've always known that I'd marry him. I'm more than a little put out that he's breaking off our engagement, just because our father stole from his. Elizabeth nodded, as if Esther's words had made sense. What are you looking for in a husband? Someone who will take care of me, of course. I'd prefer a wealthy man with servants, but I understand mail-order brides can't exactly choose their lifestyle. So, I'll say a good man who is willing to work hard, who will be faithful to me. Do you care where you go? Elizabeth asked. She turned to her desk and began flipping through the huge pile of letters there. Is Alaska too far? Esther asked. The further from here, the better. I don't ever want to see that no good goat of an ex fiance again. How about Montana? I have a letter here from a rancher who lives outside of Mangled Stump, Montana. Would that be far enough? I think it would. Esther hoped he had a big house, because they'd need room for her sister. May I read it? Oh, of course. Elizabeth handed her the letter, and for the second time that day, Esther gave her attention to a letter penned by a man. Dear Potential Bride, I find myself at something of a crossroads in my life. I've worked for the past eight years, since I turned 21, toward building a ranch here in Montana. Now I find myself ready to start working on a family. My main requirement for a wife is that she want children. I would like a whole houseful. I live in a very rural part of Montana, so social butterflies need not apply. I will require a wife who can cook, clean, and sew. If you believe you are a good candidate, please reply. Sincerely, Brody Finnegan. Esther read over the note once more before nodding. Yes, this one will do. How do I make this happen? I really need to leave town as soon as I can. Why? Elizabeth asked, obviously concerned. I won't have a place to live after tomorrow. Our mother is going to stay with her parents, but I'm not allowed to go. Esther wasn't certain if she should mention her plans to take her sister west with her, so she didn't say anything about Coral at all. You'll both stay with me then. Elizabeth acted as if the offer was something she made every day. There's plenty of room, and I could use some friends. I may have you help a bit with filing while you're here, as well. Esther stared at her with surprise. Do you mean it? It would help us out, tremendously. Of course, I mean it. Have you seen my desk? Elizabeth grinned. You need to write a letter to Brody, telling him your age and what your qualifications are. It takes about a month to get a response, so you can hide out here and make certain you avoid your former fiancé. Perfect. Esther accepted the pen and paper Elizabeth offered and quickly wrote out a reply. When she was finished, she handed the letter to Elizabeth. Elizabeth didn't even glance at it. I'll send this off first thing tomorrow. Thank you. Chapter 2 As they walked home, Coral looked at her sister. Did you mention me in the letter? Esther shook her head. I thought it best not to. You'll just be an added surprise. Did you mention you can't cook? I've got a whole month to learn. How hard can it be? Besides, you're going, and I know you know how to cook. You've been in the kitchen with Mary learning to cook every day for years. You'll help me. If all else failed, they'd make the man think that Esther was doing the cooking instead of Coral. How much did it really matter as long as the man got fed? Coral frowned. Of course, I'll help, but what if your new husband doesn't want me there? Not want you? Everyone wants you around, dear sister. No, it'll be fine. Esther refused to believe otherwise. And if the man was in an area with few women, it would be easy to marry Coral off soon after they arrived. 
She wasn't as classically pretty as Esther, but she was sweet-natured. Everyone seemed to prefer that. Coral shook her head. She wouldn't let herself believe disaster would happen. She would do her best to be indispensable. Besides, they had more important things to worry about. Like what they were going to tell their mother. They found their mother in the parlor, right where they'd left her. She was still crying. Mother, we've determined what we'll do. Now we just need to get our things packed tonight, before the men come to take the furniture tomorrow, Coral announced when she walked in. Esther watched her sister take charge, guiding their mother up the stairs and putting her to work in a way she would never be able to do. There was just something about Coral that made people not mind being managed by her. The three women worked together through the long night. First they packed their mother's things, because she had a ticket for a train that was leaving at 9.30 the following morning. Once they finished there, they went to work on the girls' rooms. There were so many things Esther would pick up and think, oh, I need to take this with me. It would look grand in my new home, but Coral would shake her head, and Esther would put it back down, knowing her sister was right. There would be limited space to take all their things to Montana. Esther's eye caught the diamond sparkling from the ring on her finger. First thing in the morning, she'd take that ring and sell it. Then she would be able to pay for Coral's ticket out west and not have to worry about asking for money from either Elizabeth or her future husband. She never wanted to have to see it again anyway. They finally fell into bed just before four in the morning, knowing they'd have to be up before seven to get mother to the train station. Esther fell into an exhausted sleep, refusing to worry about tomorrow and what may come. Asterisk. There was a mad rush the next morning, Esther, Coral, and their mother each carrying two carpet bags that held the sum total of their belongings. Esther had left many of her pretty dresses behind, knowing they just wouldn't be practical for the trip out west. She had kept one pretty silk dress, but all the other things she'd kept had been day dresses, and one nice skirt and blouse. She'd have two outfits to alternate for Sunday best, but everything else would be good for work on a ranch. Coral glanced over at Esther as they walked. Their mother suddenly seemed horribly frail to both of them, crying a bit more with each step they took. Mother, you're going to be so happy to see grandmother and grandfather again. You'll be content there. But what about you girls? Mother asked. It was the first time since everything had happened their mother had shown an interest beyond what would happen to her. We have our future settled. Don't worry about us, mother, Esther told her. Of course, I'll worry about you. You're my babies. Esther didn't respond because they'd reached the train station. They said their goodbyes, and then Esther and Coral headed back toward the center of town. They would sell Esther's ring before going on to Elizabeth's house. Do you think she'll be all right? Coral asked. Esther shrugged. She'll have grandmother and grandfather. Grandfather will probably force her to get a divorce and remarry, just so she'll be out of his hair. Coral giggled. It would be good for her. She needs to stop hiding herself away at home and get out and live. For as long as Esther could remember, their mother had slowly become a recluse. She left the house only on Sundays, and in the past few years, she'd stayed home from church more and more. Do you think one of us should have ridden the train with her and made sure she got to grandmother's all right? Coral shook her head. She needs to learn to rely on herself and not on us. Esther recognized the truth in her sister's words. Coral had been running their household since she was ten, while their mother had watched. It was too much of a burden on her younger sister, but Esther hadn't had the skills necessary to help much. She wasn't much of a manager, preferring to be told what to do for the most part. Once they'd sold Esther's ring, they headed to Elizabeth's house, the money tucked away discreetly in one of Esther's carpet bags. She didn't want anyone to realize she had any money with her. She knew everyone would think they were completely destitute, so people wouldn't bother her for her father's debts. 
They knocked on the door of the Miller house as soon as they arrived. The same man opened the door. Mrs. Carruthers, he said with a nod. Let me take you to your rooms. He led them up the stairs. I'm Bernard, the butler here. If you need anything, be sure to inform me. I help Miss Miller with her business as well as running this household. Miss Miller said that one of you would be helping her with her filing while you're here? Coral nodded. That would be me. I'm Coral. It'll be easier if you call us both by our first names. Esther is hoping she can spend time in the kitchen learning from your cook. Bernard looked at Esther with a frown. I hope you're a quick learner. Esther smiled. I hope so too. I'll certainly do my best. She'd never felt like she was quick at anything, but she knew it had to do with Coral. Coral had always been able to do everything quickly and efficiently. She was taught to sound out words, and the next thing anyone knew, she was reading the Bible all on her own at age seven. She was taught to add and subtract, and she'd quickly taken over the household accounts, exceeding even their father, a banker, on a ledger sheet. It was hard to be the older sister of a genius. You're a very fast learner, Esther. I'll help if I need to. Coral smiled sweetly. Esther would rather learn from anyone than her sister, but she didn't say so. It wasn't fair to her. Coral was a good, kind, intelligent woman. It was just so hard to feel like she was living in her shadow. That's why Esther had jumped at the chance to marry Jeremiah. At least she would no longer feel like she couldn't live up to her younger sister. Early one Friday morning, about six weeks after he'd sent off his letter to the matchmaker back east, Brody climbed onto the buckboard of his wagon and drove into town. It was a four-hour trip each way to Mangled Stump, and the prices were steep, but it was even further to the next closest town, Lost Legacy, so he knew it was the smart way to go. He drove straight to the store, needing to see if he had received a letter and buy some supplies for the next month or so. He went into town as infrequently as possible, not willing to take the time from his work to go often. When he walked in, the new shopkeeper, Jim Roberts, raised his hand in greeting. I have a letter from back east for you, Finnegan. Brody smiled, rushing to the counter, while Ralph went off and found the letter for him. Once he had it in hand, he walked outside to the quiet streets of Mangled Stump. While everyone was off at work at the mine, the town was always quiet. The womenfolk were all so busy doing their chores, it tended to be peaceful. He leaned against the wall in front of the store, reading the letter he'd received. Dear Mr. Finnegan, My name is Esther Carruthers, and I would like to be your mail-order bride. I live in a mid-sized town in Massachusetts and desperately need to be away from this place. I am a good housekeeper and seamstress, and a fair cook. I'm 18 years old and considered pretty. I have dark hair and brown eyes. Please let me know if you think we would suit. Yours truly. Esther. Brody frowned, rereading the letter. She wasn't giving him much information, but a willing woman was more than he had now. He'd take her. He went into the store and borrowed a pen and paper from Ralph. Asterisk. Esther was in the kitchen, taking a loaf of bread from the oven, when Elizabeth brought her the letter from Brody. She glanced over her shoulder with a smile. Just a second. She carefully placed the loaf on the work table and closed the oven before setting down her potholders. I do believe this loaf might just be edible. Elizabeth nodded, sniffing deeply. It smells wonderful. I can't wait to try it. Give me a minute to read this letter, and we'll slice into it. Hot bread with butter sounds delicious. Esther didn't add that she'd churned the butter herself. She'd learned a lot in the four and a half weeks she'd been apprenticing in Elizabeth's kitchen. I'll wait then. Elizabeth said, her voice filled with enthusiasm. She'd eaten a lot of Esther's meals, the good and the bad. Esther sank into a straight-back chair at the kitchen table. She realized her hands were shaking as she unfolded the letter, 
ignoring something that fell out onto her lap. Dear Esther, Thank you for your letter. I do believe you will be a good wife for me. I've enclosed money to cover your train ticket and expenses along the way. Please send a wire to let me know when your train will arrive. I will send someone to Lost Legacy in about two weeks to get it. The journey is a full day and a half drive from Lost Legacy to my ranch. I will be waiting for you in Lost Legacy and will drive to my home together. I look forward to hearing when you will arrive. Your future husband. Brody. Esther smiled at Elizabeth. He sent me train fare. I'm to wire to let him know when I'll arrive. Wonderful. Now, let's try that bread and see if you're ready to feed him. Asterisk. The next two days were a flurry of activity as Esther bought train tickets and wired Brody. The night before she was to leave, Elizabeth brought her into her study and closed the door. Before any of my brides leave to marry their spouses, I like to have a quick talk with them. Esther shook her head. Oh, my mother's already had that talk with me. There's no need for you to do it. Elizabeth blushed slightly. That's not the talk I'm speaking of. I want to discuss marriage in general. There are some men who think once they're married, their wife belongs to them, and they have the right to hurt her. If that happens to you, I want you to know that all you have to do is contact me, and I'll arrange for you to come back to Massachusetts, and you will have a place with me for as long as you need one. Oh, I'm sure that wouldn't be necessary, Esther said quickly. It might. What I'm trying to say is that you won't have to stay with a man who hurts you. You will always have options. Thank you for that. We appreciate your hospitality. We never meant to stay for so long. I take it Coral is going with you. They'd never come right out and said what the plan was, but Esther knew Elizabeth understood. Yes, she is. Elizabeth nodded. I thought so. She should have an easy time finding someone to marry there. That's what we thought. Esther stood and walked to Elizabeth, who also stood. The two women embraced. We'll write you as soon as we get to Montana. Thank you so much for all you've done for us. I've enjoyed having you both here. Coral has me more organized than I've ever dreamed of being. Elizabeth dropped her voice to a whisper. I'll probably mess up my desk as soon as you leave, just because I'll be able to again. Coral is intimidating at times. It's hard to believe she's only 17, isn't it? Esther shook her head. She'll be running Montana Territory the moment we step foot there. She hadn't figured out yet whether she should be proud of her sister's overwhelming ability to do everything or embarrassed by her. Elizabeth laughed softly. If she's not, I'll be surprised. I've never met anyone quite like your sister. That's because there is no one quite like Coral. Imagine being her older sister. She's supposed to follow in my footsteps, but I always felt like I was following in hers. It's very disconcerting to be found lacking when compared to a sister who is 18 months younger than you are. I know why you have an age limit for women you place, but she's more capable than any other woman I know. I've always felt like less when she was around. Elizabeth smiled. I understand what it's like to be overwhelmed by the reputation of your siblings. Don't worry. All of that is about to change. You'll have a man to love and take care of. Esther nodded. I certainly hope so. Chapter 3 Esther rested her head against the dirty window of the train, clutching Coral's hand. The next stop was Bear Junction, and she was nervous. More nervous than she'd ever been in her life. What if Brody looked at her and didn't find her pretty? Worse, what if he took one look at Coral and said she had to go back home? Coral squeezed Esther's hand. Stop worrying. Is it so obvious? Coral laughed softly. I can hear the wheels in your head spinning. Either he accepts me, or he doesn't. If he doesn't, there'll be somewhere for me to go. 
I'm sure there's a man close by who would marry me on sight. I really want you to be able to marry for love. That's part of the reason I'm doing this. You should have all the time in the world to meet and find a man who you care for. Why? Coral asked. I can make the best of any situation. I wish I was the one marrying first, so you could have that. You deserve it. Esther shook her head. We both know, I'm the weaker sister. No, you deserve to have time to find a man you can love. We'll see what happens, but I want you to wait until you're ready. Coral rested her head on her sister's shoulder. Whatever happens, I'm glad we're here together. Me too. Esther was less nervous with Coral at her side, even though she knew Brody may be angry upon seeing her. The train stopped and the sisters stood, gathering their belongings. After ten days on a train, they were both ready to get on with their lives. Esther got off the train first, moving to the center of the platform, Coral staying slightly behind her. Esther scanned the crowd, looking for a man in a cowboy hat, hoping to find him easily. Brody stood with his hat clutched to the front of his chest, unusually nervous. He'd never done anything like this in his life, and he wasn't certain how he was supposed to act with a new wife he'd never met. Should he kiss her in greeting? Shake her hand? Or just lead her to his wagon? He'd stopped by the parsonage on his way to the train station to warn Pastor Sands and his wife that he would be stopping by with his bride on his way out of town later. He spotted the woman he assumed was his bride, a tall brunette with pretty brown eyes. She was wearing a pink dress with some sort of pattern on it. He strode toward her, pleased with her appearance, at least. Hopefully she would have a good heart to match. He approached her, hat in hand, stopping in front of her. Esther? Esther nodded. Brody? She stared at him, her throat going dry, and her hands starting to sweat. She hoped he wouldn't try to shake her hand just then. Who wanted their marriage to start with a sweaty handshake? Yes, I'm Brody Finnegan. It's nice to meet you. He wanted to kiss her, but wondered how she'd feel if their first kiss was on a train platform. The preacher and his wife are expecting us. He reached down to pick up her bags, and she looked back over her shoulder at Coral. I, I brought my sister with me, she all, but whispered. Esther was shocked at how soft her voice was, and how very nervous she was around this man, who would be her husband in just a short while. She'd never felt that way around Jeremiah. The quickening in her stomach was new as well. Just a tingling as he looked at her. Why did she feel so differently with this man? Your sister? His voice was perplexed and his brows drew together. Why would you bring your sister? Because she had nowhere else to go. Brody looked over her shoulder at the sister. What are we going to do with her? His house was small, only two bedrooms. He wouldn't turn her out, but what about when the children came? Esther frowned at his callous question. She'll be eighteen in a month or two. I'm sure she'll find a husband quickly. She's very skilled. Much more skilled than I am. So she's planning on being with us for just a short while, he asked, needing to know the plan before he married Esther. Did you know you'd bring her with you when you answered my letter? Esther thought for a moment about denying it, but she couldn't start their marriage on a lie. I did. Her eyes met his directly. He had red hair and green eyes, the same coloring as Coral had. She wondered idly if he was planning to marry the right sister. And you didn't tell me because? Brody didn't have a huge problem with her bringing her sister, especially if she didn't plan to live with them forever. His problem was with her attempt at deception. Quite frankly, I wasn't sure if you'd agree to marry me if you knew I'd have a sister in tow. I was hoping that once we arrived, and you met us both, you'd go through with it. Esther knew that honesty was the only way to start a marriage she wanted to last. It was better he knew the truth before he married her than found out later. Coral stepped forward then, holding her hand out to Brody. I'm Coral. Brody shook Coral's hand, his eyes never leaving Esther's face. 
I could still refuse to marry you now. Esther nodded. You could. I hope you won't. We were in a tricky situation back home, and we had no idea what else to do. It seemed the right thing to do at the time. Is there anything else I need to know? There's no baby in the bag, he asked, frowning at the carpet bags he'd dropped when she announced she'd brought her sister. Esther shook her head. No baby. I was engaged to be married, right up till the day I answered your letter, but he's only kissed me. I'm still a virgin. She knew the words were somewhat crass, but considering the situation, she wanted them to be out there. Brody grinned at that. Well, at least you're honest now. Okay, let's get married. He was slightly disappointed that he wouldn't be able to make love to his wife that night. There was no privacy in the small shelter, they'd stay in halfway to the ranch. Esther let out a breath she hadn't realized she'd been holding to grab his hand and squeeze it. She stood on tiptoe and kissed his weather-worn cheek. Thank you. He caught her by the back of the neck and kissed her lips quickly before releasing her. If you're going to kiss me, do it right. Esther felt a tingling in her lips that had never happened when Jeremiah kissed her. She wanted to catch his shoulders and bring Brody back for another kiss, but with her sister standing there and the whole of Lost Legacy looking on, she couldn't bring herself to do it. He bent and picked up her carpet bags, leaving Coral to carry her own. Let's go get married. He helped Esther onto the wagon seat and then Coral, walking around to get in beside Esther. It wouldn't be the affectionate drive back to his ranch he'd had in mind but maybe it was better if they got to know one another before they moved on to the next level in their relationship. Mrs. Sands welcomed both women with open arms, not asking about why there were two and not just the one they'd expected. I'm sure you ladies will want to wash up after your long journey. Oh, yes, if you don't mind, Coral responded for both of them. I've already filled the pitcher with hot water. She led them into a spare bedroom, with a pitcher and bowl off in a corner, leaving them alone. Esther washed first, unfastening the front of her dress, and dropping it down around her waist. I feel so filthy, she complained, reaching for the bar of soap resting on the edge of the bowl. Coral nodded. I do too. So hurry up. Esther washed quickly, not because of anything Coral said, but so she wouldn't keep Brody waiting. What do you think of him? she asked, knowing there would be no question in Coral's mind whom she was referring to. Coral shrugged. He's handsome enough, and he seems to be willing to accept the fact that I came with you and will stay with you for a while. The important thing is what do you think of him? Esther blushed, concentrating on washing instead of looking at her sister. I like him. I really like the way he kisses more than Jeremiah? Oh, yes. I always felt a little, dirty after Jeremiah kissed me. When Brody kissed me, I just wanted to kiss him more. Esther blushed as she admitted it, but who could she talk to about those things if not her sister? Maybe what happened with father is the best thing for both of us then. Maybe. I'll reserve judgment for a while. She walked to the bed and sat down, rummaging through her carpet bag. She pulled out a dress to see if it looked terribly wrinkled. I have got to get out of this thing. I feel like this dress could walk by itself, it's so dirty. Coral nodded, unbuttoning her dress and dropping it to the floor. She washed, wearing just her petticoat. He seems like a nice man. I do think you'll be happy with him. I just have to wait and see. Ten minutes later, the sisters were washed and dressed, and they stepped out into the parlor. Are you ladies ready to start? the minister asked. Esther nodded. Yes, sir. We are. She moved to stand beside Brody, looking up at him as he stood straight beside her. He took her hand in his, squeezing it gently. The wedding was short and brief, and Esther barely remembered it later. Except for the kiss, of course. She'd always remember that kiss for the rest of her life. When the minister said, I now pronounce you husband and wife. 
you may kiss the bride, Brody pulled Esther to him by the hand he held. He slipped his hands around her waist, lowering his mouth to hers. The kiss that followed was nothing like she had ever imagined a wedding kiss to be. He held her just a little bit too close, his lips ravaging hers. As he kissed her, her hands moved up to circle his shoulders, and she pressed closer than she should have. He nipped her bottom lip before raising his head. His eyes were half-closed, and she saw something in them she didn't recognize. It was almost predatory. The pastor cleared his throat, pulling at the front of his collar. Congratulations. Brody's eyes didn't leave Esther's as he replied. Thank you, sir. Coral's eyes were wide as she looked back and forth between her sister and her new brother-in-law. Brody smiled at his new bride. Let's start toward home. They all said goodbye to the pastor as they headed for the door. Esther pulled away from Brody and hurried back to thank Mrs. Sands. I so appreciate you thinking to have warm water waiting for us. It made my sister and I feel very welcome. She took the older woman's hands in hers and squeezed them tightly. Mrs. Sands smiled. I was happy to be part of your big day. Esther hurried to rejoin Brody. Now we can start toward home. Brody had watched the whole thing with a smile. His wife had manners. Maybe she hadn't been completely upfront with him before the wedding, but he had a feeling she would be now. Five minutes later, they were out of Lost Legacy and on their way toward the ranch. How far is your ranch? Esther asked, needing to break the uncomfortable silence. It's going to take a day and a half to get there. We'll stop at a small cabin along the way, put there for travelers. Esther looked at her sister. She hoped that Brody would be willing to wait for their wedding night, so her sister would hear no untoward noises. The beauty of Montana Territory was not lost on either of the sisters. They'd lived in the Northeast their entire lives, never traveling far at all from their home. In fact, their first train trip had been to Montana. It's beautiful. Coral looked everywhere around her, her eyes lit with excitement. She thought of this whole thing as a huge adventure. Brody smiled. Do you think you'll try and find a man from this area? Make Montana your home? Definitely. Not only do I want to be close to my sister, I can't imagine ever leaving this place. You two must be really close. I was very close to my brothers, before I left Ireland. Esther smiled. I knew I recognized that Irish brogue. How long have you been here? I moved to Montana when I was 21. I left Ireland when I was 18 and I worked in a factory in New York City for three years. I definitely prefer Montana to New York. Oh, I think I would too. I can imagine living in a city as big as New York. Our town of Beckham wasn't tiny, but for big city attractions we always made the drive to Boston. Brody shrugged. A man does what he must. I'm happy that I don't have to do that any longer. My ranch makes me very happy. Is it a big ranch? Esther had been engaged to the son of the richest man in her hometown. It seemed strange to be married to this man now. Strange, but good. It's certainly not the biggest ranch in Montana, but it's not small. I have five men who work for me full time. Coral's ears perked up at that. Are your men married? Brody shook his head. Nope. None of them. And there are plenty of unmarried men in Mangled Stump as well. Mangled Stump? Esther asked. Is that near you? Near is a relative term. It's about a half-day's wagon ride away, but it's the nearest town. Will we be so isolated that I won't have a chance to meet men? Coral asked. Not at all. Why, we're even starting a country school about two miles from my ranch. There will only be about six children attending, but that's enough that we need a teacher. We built the schoolhouse this summer. Is there a church nearby? Esther asked. He shook his head. 
No, but the teacher we hired said that he would be happy to preach for Sunday services in the schoolhouse if we'd like. Sounds like we'll not be as isolated as I expected. He laughed. Oh, we'll be pretty isolated. There are a few other ranchers in the area, and we'll all have a chance to get together on occasion. There aren't a lot of people around though. Don't expect to have a busy social life. Esther was slightly disappointed. She hadn't expected a busy social life, but she'd certainly hoped for one. It's what she was used to, and she felt at ease in the middle of a social whirl. What else was she good for? Chapter 4 They were about two hours out of town when Brody pulled the wagon to the side of the dirt road. I paid Mrs. Sands to make a picnic for us. She always packs more than anybody could ever need, so I'm sure there's enough for all three of us. Of course, she doesn't think I paid her. I told her to give the money to the poor if she didn't want it, so that's what she'll probably do. Esther smiled, liking the idea of a picnic lunch. Sounds lovely. Coral looked between the other two, jumping down from the wagon. I think I'll go for a walk in the woods. I'll be back in about ten minutes. Will she be safe? Esther asked Brody. Oh, certainly. As long as she doesn't go too far off, she shouldn't run into any hostile animals. Esther looked over her shoulder at her sister, who was already halfway to the woods. Be careful. I will. Coral called back. Esther looked back at Brody. Being Coral, if she runs into something dangerous, she'll just shimmy her way up a tree, and then she will start dropping acorns on its head in such a way that it will die immediately. Brody's eyes widened. She sounds self-sufficient. Esther shook her head. In a way, you would never believe if I told you. She is a sight to behold. I'm not the best cook, but she'll help me. By the time she's ready to marry, I'll be able to cook a seven-course feast with a two-hour notice. She's been able to do that since she was four. Esther knew she was exaggerating, but only a little, and it was nice to be able to explain about her sister to a stranger. Everyone who knew them just stared at Coral in awe. Brody grinned. Are you a little jealous of your younger sister? Esther put her hand over her chest, trying to look innocent. Oh, no. I'm a lot jealous of my younger sister. He laughed. Good. But let's be honest, I wouldn't want someone that perfect. I need someone as flawed as I am. Flaws, I have. If you want someone flawed, you found the right woman. I'm glad to hear it. He reached into the wagon and took out the picnic basket he'd set back there. If you grab the quilt and spread it wherever you want it, I'll put the picnic basket down. Esther reached into the back of the wagon and picked up the quilt that was lying there, folded nicely. She wondered briefly if he'd folded it himself or someone had done it for him. She carried it to a flat piece of ground. It's beautiful here. I'm not sure what I expected, but whatever it was, it was nothing like this. I think I expected to see snow. He laughed at that. Not usually in September. I've seen it, but it's really not common. Esther spread out the quilt, sitting on it with her legs crossed, and her skirt arranged nicely around her. I'm very happy to hear that. I wouldn't want to be fighting snow all year round. Brody set the picnic basket onto the quilt. I have no idea what she packed for us, but I'm sure it's good. Mrs. Sands is known to be a fabulous cook. Esther dug into the picnic basket, not looking at him as she pulled out fried chicken, baked beans, and potato salad, along with a loaf of bread and some butter. There was also a jar of lemonade in the basket and three glasses. Thank you for being so kind about my sister being with me. I know that couldn't have been easy for you. He sighed. It's not ideal, but I'm not going to turn her out. I should have told you about her before you sent the money for my ticket. Yes, you should have, but you didn't know me and had no idea how I'd react. I do understand. 
I'd honestly rather not have your younger sister living with us during our first few months of marriage, but I can understand the necessity. She'll pull her weight. Knowing Coral, she'll start her own business and start paying you rent within a week or two. He laughed. That really isn't necessary. He sat beside her on the quilt, his arm going around her shoulders. I just want to have a chance to have time alone with my wife. As strange as it felt to allow him to touch her, she knew he had every right, and she liked it. I know. So does Coral. Why do you think she disappeared? He grinned at that. I'm glad she did. It gave us a chance to speak openly. I worry we won't have any time to be private with one another with her here. Catching his meaning, Esther blushed. We'll find a way. We can go for walks, or send her for walks. I hope you have a two-bedroom house. I do. Thank God. I don't know what we'd do otherwise. I'm not going to not make love to you until she's gone, but I don't want to be heard by her either. I'm sorry to make it so difficult for you, she said, her eyes landing on his lips. She remembered how soft they'd felt on hers during the wedding. She wanted to ask him to kiss her again, but she wouldn't be so forward. She'd been raised better than that. Brody noticed where her eyes had landed and leaned down, pressing his mouth to hers. He traced her lips with his tongue, silently asking for entrance. Esther parted her lips for him, scooting closer to him on the quilt. She liked the way he kissed her. She could feel a burning in her low belly as his tongue slid into her mouth to tangle with hers. There was a loud cough from behind them as Coral approached. Esther pulled away, her face red. At least she gave us fair warning of her approach. He sighed. This is what life is going to be like until we get her married off. She needs to start courting someone this week. Maybe I'll auction her off to my men, he said, winking to let her know he was joking. You should have them all submit husband proposals, kind of like a mail-order bride letter. She can choose between the letters and get to know them based on which she likes the best. He laughed. Maybe I'll do that. We'll see how long it takes before the men start buzzing around her. Coral collapsed onto the quilt taking the plate that Esther offered her. I hope you're hungry, because we have enough to feed a family of ten. Esther told her. Starving. The last thing I ate was a sandwich right before we went to sleep last night. Coral didn't wait as she took a big bite of her chicken. What made you decide to be a mail-order bride? Brody asked Esther. Esther choked, taking a big drink of her lemonade. I'm not sure you're ready to hear that story. He looked back and forth, between the two sister. Now I know that I need to hear it. What happened? Well, we were raised in an affluent household in a medium-sized town in Massachusetts. We were happy there. I met a boy in school, and we courted, and he asked me to marry him as soon as we graduated. Brody nodded. She'd told him she was engaged earlier. Well, I was out shopping about six weeks ago, and when I got home, I found Coral and our mother in the parlor. Mother was crying, and she told me to take back everything I'd purchased, because we couldn't afford it. It took a few questions before the whole story came out. Esther took a bite of her chicken, thinking about the best way to tell the rest of the story. The police had come and arrested Father that day. He was caught embezzling money from the bank he worked in. The one he'd worked in for as long as I could remember. The owner of the bank was my fiancé's father. His eyes widened. His new bride, the sweet innocent woman looking at him with wide brown eyes, was the daughter of a felon? There was a letter from Jeremiah waiting for me, telling me he wanted nothing more to do with me, and that I should leave town to avoid embarrassment for both of us. Mother was on her way to go live with her parents, because she couldn't deal with the embarrassment. Coral told me about a mail-order bride agency right there in town, so I went and talked to the matchmaker. I sent you a letter that very night. She daintily wiped her mouth as she finished her story, taking a quick sip of her lemonade. 
She hadn't planned to tell him quite so soon, but she was glad the story was out. Brody shook his head, having a hard time believing it all. And your grandparents didn't want you, and your sister? Coral answered that question. They always hated our father, so they were never exactly fond of us. They took mother back, because she's a recluse, but were not exactly the grandchildren they always wanted. That's really sad. He reached out and took Esther's hand in his. Your grandparents are missing out on two very sweet young ladies. I think so, Coral said as she took a big bite of her chicken. I could have helped grandfather with his business, but he's too old-fashioned for that. He'd have been fine with me going off to be a seamstress, but he never would have let me keep the books. Brody gaped at her. He'd rarely met a female who admitted to being good at keeping books. Are you skilled at math then? Coral shrugged. I'm skilled at everything. She obviously didn't say it to brag. She really must be skilled at everything. Except music. I have a tin ear. Well, that's something at least. I'm happy to hear you're not good at everything. Why? Coral asked. I like being good at things. I hear you're an excellent cook and will be helping Esther learn to cook better, he said, looking for a more comfortable subject. Yes, I'll help her. She's not a terrible cook now. Why, she learned a lot about making decent meals while we lived with Elizabeth Miller. The matchmaker? You lived with her? We had nowhere else to go after father was arrested. The bank sent men to take all of our things. We were allowed to take our clothes, but nothing else, Esther told him softly. He understood better then. And Miss Miller let you live with her free of charge? Esther shrugged. I think she would have, but Coral organized her business papers while we were there. And everything else. Coral couldn't stand to see anything in disarray. She'd not only filed all of Elizabeth's papers during their month with the matchmaker, she'd also alphabetized her books and reorganized the kitchen cabinets. Even her drawers had been rearranged in a way that made sense to Coral. Well, I'm glad you were able to earn your keep. I was starting to wonder if I should send her a bit more money for your room and board. Coral shook her head. No need. We definitely earned our keep. While we were there one of the maids had a baby, so we did some of the housework, and Esther helped with the cooking as well. We worked during that time. Not that she wasn't incredibly kind to allow us to live there, because she was. Brody wasn't certain how to respond to that, so he didn't. He found Coral a bit intimidating. He was glad he'd gotten the soft-spoken sister and not the know-it-all. Twenty minutes later, they were back on the road and headed toward the ranch. They would need to travel at least another four hours before they could stop for the night. There was a small shelter at that point where they could stay the night. If it was just him, he wouldn't mind sleeping out in the open or under the wagon, but with two women to look out for, it would be better if they got to the shelter. There was only one large room, and he hoped he would be able to find a way to at least sleep with his new bride in his arms, even if he wasn't allowed to have relations with her yet. Well, allowed wasn't the right word. If he couldn't find a way with her younger sister right there. He sighed. It would be best if he waited for that until he was at home on his ranch anyway. His sweet bride deserved a good bed for her wedding night. The sisters talked to one another as they drove, and he enjoyed observing them. Listening to them, it sounded as if Coral was the elder, but every once in a while, she would say something so utterly naive that he'd realize she really was younger. The women had an odd relationship, and he was glad to observe it. What's your favorite food? Esther asked him, surprising him by suddenly including him in the conversation. Mine? Pot roast, he told her. Esther frowned. I haven't made a pot roast yet. I'll make sure that's something Coral teaches me to cook before she marries. You talk as if her marrying very soon is a given. Esther shrugged. I've never seen Coral put her mind to anything that didn't happen as soon as she wanted it to. 
I'll be shocked if she doesn't marry within a week of her 18th birthday. Why are you so determined to wait until you're 18 to marry? He asked Coral. Coral shrugged. Elizabeth Miller wouldn't let a girl go off to be a mail-order bride until she turned 18. I've always thought many girls marry much too young, so I've adopted the age Elizabeth uses. It sounds like it's a good one to me. I see, he said, but really he didn't. His sisters had all married before they turned 16. 18 is practically an old maid in Ireland. Coral made a face. I'm glad I don't live in Ireland then. I think women should be allowed to grow and learn things before they start pushing out babies. You don't want children? He asked, shocked. Most girls he knew were infatuated with the idea of having babies. Coral shrugged. I guess I wouldn't mind having one or two. I certainly don't want a whole houseful like Esther does. Since we were little girls she's dreamed of having babies. I think babies are fine, but they won't complete me. I need to find something within myself that will do that. He had no idea what she was talking about, so he didn't pursue it. The girl was odd, and that was that. He looked at Esther. You want a lot of children? Esther nodded. As much as it infuriated our parents, I've always thought eight or ten children would be the perfect number. You did specify that you wanted a woman who wanted children. He smiled. That sounds like a good number to me too. I like the idea of having several boys to help around the ranch, but girls to help you at home as well. Esther smiled, resting her head on his shoulder. The man was going to be good for her, as long as they could get through having her sister living with them. She just hoped he didn't realize how much better of a wife Coral would be. Chapter 6 When they got back to the shelter, Brody offered to sleep on the floor while Esther and Coral took the bed. In a way, Esther was relieved, because she would feel funny sleeping with her new husband with her sister watching, but in a way, she was disappointed. She liked being close to him already. Brody stepped outside while the two ladies got ready for bed and crawled between the sheets. While they waited for him to return, Coral asked, You like him, don't you? Esther blushed, but nodded. So much more than I'd thought I would. And he doesn't mind you staying with us either. Mostly, he didn't mind anyway. I know I'm going to be in the way. You don't have to lie. I'll do my best to find a man as quickly as I can. No one here knows my reputation, and I think that will help. Esther giggled at that. You make it sound like you have a reputation for being a wicked woman. Well, we both know it's not that. I just, I need to find a way to control my urges, to always show how smart I am. The boys in school were intimidated by me. Most people I've ever met have been. Coral sighed. I need to find myself a man who is either so brilliant, he outshines me in every way, or one so simple. He doesn't realize how smart I am. Men just don't seem to like smart women. Esther frowned at that. She'd had no idea her sister was insecure about her ability to catch a man. She knew that both Jeremiah and Brody were intimidated by her though. Why wouldn't a man look at her and think about ways she could enhance his life? Instead of feeling like they were less because of Quarrel's abilities. I wish I knew what to tell you. I certainly don't think you can hide who you are for long. Coral shook her head. I shouldn't have to. I suppose men might be different in Montana, but we'll see. The door opened, effectively ending their conversation. Brody looked at the two women lying in the bed and wished he could be the one beside his new bride instead of her sister. There was always tomorrow. Asterisk. They arrived at Brody's ranch in the middle of the next day. Brody helped each of the women down from the wagon and opened the front door for them. It'll be time for supper in a couple of hours. You two get to work on that and settling in, and I'll go check on my men. I'll see you at supper. He dipped his head to kiss Esther's pretty lips before turning back to his horses. He was immediately in work mode. 
Esther went into the house first, having no idea what she'd find there. It was more what she would call a cabin than a house, with two small bedrooms close beside one another and a fair-sized room that served as kitchen, dining room, and parlor all at once. Esther closed her eyes for a moment, thinking of the beautiful home they'd been raised in. She would get used to living this way. She had to. Coral pushed up her sleeves and walked to the kitchen, clearing the dirty dishes from the table. As soon as Esther saw her sister get to work, she realized what a mess the house was in. She hadn't been able to see past the tiny house and lack of nice furnishings. Esther was thankful to see a water pump in the kitchen so she wouldn't have to walk out to the well every time she needed water. It would be especially handy in the winter months. Together, they cleaned what was obviously day's worth of dirty dishes and pots and pans. As soon as they were done, Coral found the entrance to the cellar, scouting out the food situation, while Esther swept the kitchen floor. Esther continued through the small house, changing sheets and gathering dirty clothes, while Coral sorted out the food for supper. By the time Coral had made a simple stew out of the salt pork, potatoes, and carrots she found in the cellar, Esther had the house looking like it merely needed a good cleaning, rather than like an army of very slovenly elves had resided there. Asterisk. Brody had five employees working for him, helping around the ranch, and he rode out to check on the work they'd done in his absence. It appeared the fence had been completed, and the herd had been moved into their new pasture. He was thankful his foreman had worked so hard to keep the other men on task. He found all five men doing another round of fence inspection around the herd. He rode up to Jasper Eaton, one of his most trusted men. How'd things go while I was gone? He asked, staring out at the cattle. Seems like some of the herd have escaped since we built the fence. We're working on making sure there are no holes. That sounds good. Tell me, have you thought about marriage? My new wife's sister came with her, and I'd love for you to meet her. Jasper shook his head. No, thank you. He didn't meet Brody's eyes. Why not? You have something against marriage? Brody realized he'd never spoken to the man about his future plans before. I'm not fit to marry. Don't say that. Of course, you are. Jasper's mother had been a lady of the evening, and he'd always felt inferior as a result. Instead of responding, Jasper rode away, choosing a section of fence that still needed to be gone over. Brody frowned after him. How can I convince the man he's just as good as everyone else? He doesn't need to spend his whole life paying for his mother's mistakes. He moved on to the next man and then the next, carefully explaining the situation to all of them. Jasper was the only one who didn't want to get to know Coral better. Maybe the others were nervous about courting the boss's sister-in-law, but they knew the scarcity of women in the area and were willing to work through it. He decided to have a different man for dinner every night that week. It was Tuesday, so he'd have guests Wednesday through Saturday evenings, and hopefully one of the men would be perfect for Coral. When he entered the house a few hours later, he saw his wife and new sister-in-law working together to put supper on the table. Coral was standing at the stove, a long wooden spoon in her hand, while Esther hurried around setting the table. She'd picked some flowers and put them into a glass in the center of the table in an attempt to pretty up the place. As soon as he saw it, he felt guilty. He should have made more of an effort to make the house welcoming for his new bride. He hurried to her side, pressing a kiss to her cheek. Did you find everything you needed? Esther nodded, tired from the hard work they'd put in that afternoon. She wasn't used to the kind of work she'd be doing as a ranch wife, but she wouldn't complain. It was her job to keep the house while he kept the ranch going. Yes. Coral cooked this evening, but we're going to have to go for supplies soon. Coral can make a meal appear out of what looks like nothing to me. I don't have her skills. He frowned at that. He didn't like her comparing herself unfavorably to her younger sister. You'll learn. I will. In the meantime, I'll need to get some more supplies. He sighed. 
He had just taken four days off to go get her, and he should have gotten supplies while they were in town. It hadn't seemed to matter once he saw her though. Now he was going to have to take another full day off to take the women into Mangled Stump. He looked between them. How long can we last with what we have? Coral shrugged. Probably two or three days if I get really creative. If you want meals that you'll really enjoy, we can make it through breakfast tomorrow. He was torn. He was finally going to be able to eat decent meals, because he had a wife, but he didn't have the supplies she needed to cook for them. He really needed to work, though. Of course, the men would start coming one by one the following night, and if Coral cooked as well as it smelled like she did, she'd be married on her 18th birthday. We'll go in the morning, then. I'll want to start as soon as the sun is up. He rubbed the back of his neck. I'll need to have someone milk the cow for me in the morning. Can dinner wait ten minutes? Esther looked at Coral, who nodded. Yes, of course. Let me go talk to Jasper then. He'll take care of it. As soon as he disappeared out the door, Esther glared at Coral. You could have been nicer about the lack of supplies. Why? A truth is a truth. Why should I sugarcoat it? Because it's kind. You're smart, Coral. Why can't you show compassion when you talk to people? Coral frowned. I do show compassion. All the time. You're too blunt. Esther put the biscuits into a bowl and covered them with a towel, before putting them on the table. I don't know how to be any other way. Esther eyed her sister for a moment. You were always so smart, mother didn't feel the need to drill manners and being a lady into you like she did me. She obviously thought you would learn on your own. Maybe you can learn something from me. Coral made a face, but finally nodded. All right. I'll do my best to learn from you. Chapter 7 After supper, Esther and Brody went for a long walk. Walking along the ranch, he told her about his property and the men who worked for him. I've invited the men to come for supper to meet Coral. They'll start coming tomorrow night, and there are four who will each come a different night through Saturday. I thought you said five men worked for you? Brody sighed. The fifth man doesn't think he's good enough to marry. Not good enough to marry? Does he realize she's the daughter of a man who will spend the rest of his days behind bars for embezzling? I didn't share my wife's business with my employees, he said stiffly. Are you embarrassed of me? Esther asked, her eyes wide at the prospect. Of course not. I just don't think it's something you'll want advertised, he said, avoiding eye contact with her. She bit her lip, hating that he was ashamed of her past. She'd been raised in one of the most affluent families in her hometown, and now she was almost a pariah. The same things that had happened back home were being repeated here. I see. She wanted to turn away from him and run back to the house, burying herself in her bed to cry, but she was stronger than that. Instead she continued to walk with him, acting as if nothing was happening. My men seemed excited at the prospect of meeting an eligible young lady. Maybe Coral will marry soon then. Suddenly, Esther didn't want her sister to go. She wanted her to stay with them forever. Only Coral knew how she felt about their family's shame. That's what you want, isn't it? he asked, surprised that she was acting strangely. Now they were home, on his ranch, she seemed to be a different woman. Was she not really the warm affectionate woman he'd gotten to know on their trip home? She nodded. It's what I want, of course. I want Coral to be happy. But she's my sister, and the only person I feel like I know well in the whole territory. I guess it seems strange to have her go and live with someone else. I can understand that. To some extent he could. But he wished she would rely on him and not on her sister. As they walked, she grew more and more nervous about what their night would entail. She certainly didn't want her sister to hear anything. Finally, she decided she simply needed to talk to him about the problem and get it out in the open. 
I'm not sure if I can go through with the wedding night, she told him, her voice a mere whisper. Why not, he asked, stopping and turning to her. He did his best not to get angry, but he didn't know how to stop it. Coral will be right in the next room. So, we'll be quiet. She shook her head. I would be too self-conscious. He closed his eyes, letting the disappointment wash over him. So you're not going to be willing to consummate our marriage until your sister marries and moves out. I could demand my husbandly rights. Esther met his eyes, her own sad. You could. I don't know if I'd ever be able to forgive you, but you could. He rubbed the back of his neck, nodding abruptly. Hopefully, one of my men will want to court her. I hope so too. I'm not trying to be difficult, but I don't think I could, you know. I understand. He took her hand and led her back toward the house. We'll just get her married off as soon as we can. Esther nodded. She was so happy he understood. Now we'll have some time to court as well. Just what I always wanted. I get to court my wife while her sister watches. Asterisk. When Esther woke the next morning, she rolled out of bed quickly, wanting to make breakfast for her husband before their first full day in their home together. She woke Coral before heading out of the smaller bedroom they shared. She was thankful she had made the decision not to consummate their marriage, because she'd heard every sound Brody had made through the night, from tossing and turning to snoring. No, her sister didn't need to hear them, and she didn't need to worry about her sister hearing them. She started a fire in the stove while Coral went out to collect the eggs that had been laid. She decided to make pancakes, because it was something she'd made a few times back in Elizabeth's home, and they'd always turned out well. She needed the first meal she cooked for Brody to be perfect. She carefully cut off slices of bacon and cooked them while she mixed the batter for the pancakes. Hopefully Brody enjoyed pancakes and bacon. She hated that she didn't know his tastes any better than she did. Brody wandered out into the main area while she was pouring the pancake batter into the pan, making four circles, or trying to anyway. Her circles looked more like deformed bugs than anything else. No matter. They would taste good. Brody put his arms around her from behind, pulling her back against him and kissing her ear. Are we alone in the house? His voice was deep and raspy from sleep, and she felt a tingle of energy shoot through her at his words. Only for as long as it takes Coral to gather eggs, so not for long. Long enough, he muttered, turning her in his arms and pressing his lips to hers. She lost herself in his kiss for a moment, before remembering breakfast. You're going to make me burn the pancakes. Behave yourself. She hurriedly turned and flipped the pancakes, making a bit of a mess in the pan. Oh, I should have let Coral do this. I'm so inept. Coral came into the house then, setting the basket of eggs on the work table. Brody was angry just seeing his new sister-in-law, even though he knew his feelings were ridiculous. I'll be back. He was out of the house before Esther could respond to him. Am I causing problems between you? Coral asked bluntly. I hate the idea of you two not getting along because of me. Esther sighed. You're not really causing problems exactly. It's just that this house is so small, I worry that we'll be too loud if we consummate. Coral's eyes widened. I can understand that. What can we do? I don't want to come between you. We need to find you a husband. As soon as we can. I think if we're planning a wedding for your birthday, he'll feel better about our future. Esther hated to put that kind of pressure on her sister, but she wasn't sure her marriage could last if she didn't. This was not a good way to start a marriage at all. Why hadn't she realized that before they left Beckham? Coral frowned. You said he was bringing in his men to meet me for dinners this week? Esther nodded. He is. Every night a different man. Why don't I plan to make dessert every night then? I know you want to cook for Brody, and I think you still need a little instruction. And my cooking can be shown off as well. 
Esther took the second set of pancakes and set them on another plate. That's probably a good idea. I know I'm an excellent baker, and maybe the men will be more interested in me because of that. I hope so. Asterisk. After their trip to town, Brody immediately rode out to work with his men. Esther and Coral worked together in the kitchen with Coral, giving pointers wherever Esther needed them. Once everything was started, Coral turned to Esther. It's time for you to learn something new. Laundry. Esther made a face. It was bad enough she was doing dishes, scraping off other people's leftover food. Laundry? Actually putting her hands on clothing that others had worn and soiled? Do I need to learn today? Coral frowned. It can wait until tomorrow. We don't have time for everything to dry after going to town today anyway. Today we'll wash the windows. Windows? Doesn't the rain wash them? Coral shook her head at her sister. Not well enough. You want your house to look pretty and well kept, right? I want a maid to do that part for me. You don't have one here. Coral's voice was free of emotion. I know you thought you'd spend the rest of your life being pampered, but it's not happening. You need to learn to do for yourself. All right. Show me how to wash windows. Esther was resigned. If she couldn't have a maid, no one would know it by looking at her house. As much as she hated it, it was her responsibility, and she had never been one to shirk. When Brody came in for supper, two hours later, the windows shone brightly. There was a fresh bouquet of flowers in the center of the table in a new vase Esther had purchased with the little bit of money she had left from the sale of her engagement ring. He looked around and smiled, walking to Esther and kissing her cheek. You've worked hard today. Esther nodded. Coral's teaching me to do several things I never thought I'd need to do. Brody looked at Coral grudgingly. Thank you. Coral nodded. I'm happy to help in any way I can. I appreciate you allowing me to live here until my birthday. The door opened again and a young man in his early twenties stepped into the house with a bouquet of flowers in his hands. He held them out for Coral, and she took them with a smile. Thank you so much. The young man removed his hat and nodded. You're welcome, Miss Coral. Obviously you know my name. Would you mind sharing yours? Coral asked directly. I'm Adam. The blonde-haired blue-eyed cowboy was very appealing to the eyes, but Esther wanted to cover her nose at his smell. Of course, he'd been out on the range all day. It's nice to meet you, Adam, Esther said with a smile. You as well, Mrs. Finnegan. He dipped his head to his boss's wife. Coral smiled sweetly. I made dessert tonight. I sure hope you'll save some room for it. Adam nodded, pulling out a chair for Coral. She just looked at him. I'll be helping serve the meal, but thank you for your kind manners. She hurried off to help her sister. Did he really think I'd just sit there and allow you to do all the work? She asked in a whisper. Esther shrugged. Well, you are entertaining him. Why don't you sit? I certainly have the ability to serve the meal. I know, but I wouldn't ever leave you to do it all alone. That would make me seem lazy. Once the food was on the table, and Brody had said a prayer to bless the meal, Adam looked at Coral, clearing his throat. So, you're from back east? Coral nodded. Yes, I've lived in Massachusetts my entire life. Oh, that sounds nice. I grew up in Wisconsin, but moved west, because I've always wanted to work with cattle. In Wisconsin, we did nothing except milk cows, grow wheat, and make cheese. Milking cows and making cheese sound very interesting to me. Did you ever actually make cheese yourself? Can you explain the process? Coral leaned toward the young man, her eyes lit with enthusiasm. Esther hid a smile behind her napkin. Coral was always trying to learn new things. Adam shook his head. No, ma'am. 
I left Wisconsin before I was old enough to do much of the cheesemaking myself. I only assisted my father. Oh, Coral said, obviously disappointed. So what do you do for Brody? Whatever he tells me to do. I'm willing to do anything as long as it will help. Esther knew Adam was losing her sister, so she jumped in with a question. What kind of books do you like to read, Adam? Adam made a face. Oh, where I grew up there wasn't a school near enough to go to, so I never learned. My ma could have taught me, I guess, but I just never was inclined in that direction. Coral's eyes widened, obviously shocked at the notion of not wanting to read. I love to read. You can learn so much from books. I think experience is the best teacher, Adam said, obviously annoyed by the turn the conversation had taken. Esther watched her sister's face close, and she knew that Adam had been crossed off her sister's mental list of possible husbands. It was a good thing there were three more men who were scheduled to come over that week. Chapter 8 Coral confirmed what Esther was thinking as they lay in bed together that night. I can't marry a man who doesn't even have a desire to learn to read. What is wrong with him? Everyone should make the most of himself. Doesn't he know what country he lives in? Esther smiled. You may have to get used to the idea that not everyone is like you. I think you need to maybe set your expectations a little lower where men are concerned. But you got a good man who can read. If reading is your main requirement, I'll tell Brody. He can avoid bringing home any other men that can't read. Coral thought about it for a moment, before nodding. Yes, I think that would be best. Asterisk. Coral taught Esther to do the laundry the next day. As they were hanging the last of the clothes on the line, Esther frowned. I think I'm going to hate laundry day more than any other day of the week. Of course, she hated all the chores she'd been taught to do. Managing servants would be so much easier for her. Coral laughed. Make Monday laundry day then. You'll get it out of the way, and you won't have to worry about it again for another week. I suppose I could do that. When Mondays aren't rainy. What do we do with the clothes on rainy days? Or when it's snowy? If we hang clothes on the line in the winter, they'll just freeze. Esther had never paid attention to how things like laundry were accomplished, because she had always expected to have someone to do it for her, but she knew Coral would know. Coral knew everything. You hang them in the cellar. The cellar? All right. We'll pray for warm temperatures all winter, because that would be even worse than hanging them outside. We need to bake some bread today, Coral said. Cornbread was fine for supper last night, but most men want real bread most of the time. Esther nodded. That at least was something she felt like she could do. Joseph came to supper that night. He had dark hair and brown eyes, and he was at least forty. Much too old to marry her sister. Esther wanted to tell him to go away. He was quiet through the meal, carefully watching the two sisters and listening to the conversation. After supper, he asked Coral to walk with him. I thought it would be nice if we had a chance to get to know one another. Coral nodded, and Esther watched the two of them leave. Esther wished her sister would learn the feminine art of blushing and acting shy, but she knew her sister would tell her it was a waste of her time. She thought everything that didn't accomplish something was a waste of her time. Brody came around the table and drew her to her feet. Do you think she likes him? Esther shrugged. You can never tell with Coral. You don't think he's a little too old for her? Brody sighed. I know he's too old for her, but he's my only man who can read and who is looking for a wife. Jasper could read, but he had made it clear he wasn't going near Coral. Esther frowned. Well, we'll see what she says. We may have to have a small party, so people can come and meet her. He contemplated that for a moment, before nodding. We could do that. There are other ranchers in the area, and even a new schoolmaster. He didn't want her to have to go through the trouble of preparing for a party if he could do it more easily. A new schoolmaster? 
Is he young? Brody shrugged. I haven't met him yet, but I believe so. The school is on a small portion of our land that I donated for it. There are only six students. Jackson is his name. Jackson Smythe. He's supposed to start doing church services in October as well. We don't have a preacher close enough to take on that duty. She nodded. Could we just invite him to supper? And skip the party? I would hope that a schoolteacher would be smart enough for my sister. She rolled her eyes. I know it seems like she's never going to find anyone, but I agree that neither of the men she's met so far are suitable. The door slammed open and closed, and the couple, who had been standing close, jerked away from one another to look at Coral. That man. He told me that I should let him touch me in very inappropriate places so that he could be sure that what I had was all me and not cotton. Esther's eyes widened, her hand going to her mouth. I hope you didn't let him. Of course not. Coral looked at Brody. I'm not impressed with the men who work for you. He sighed, rubbing the back of his neck. I'm sorry. Esther and I thought he was too old for you anyway. Well, of course he was. I thought you were so desperate to be rid of me, you'd dump me off on anyone, where I never would have stepped out with him. Coral rolled up the sleeves to her dress, with jerky angry movements. I'll wash while you dry, Esther. I need to do some scrubbing to get rid of this anger. Esther hurried to her sister's side to dry the dishes as soon as she washed them. She'd seen Coral in a fit of anger, and it wasn't something she ever cared to see again. She was a good, caring woman, but if you made her angry, the world might just come crashing down on your head. While they worked, Coral grumbled under her breath, and Esther carefully dried each dish, putting it away. Why are men so ridiculous? Why can't they understand women need to be treated with kindness if they want to, to, do that to them? Esther grinned as her sister's enormous vocabulary failed her. Probably because they don't need the tender feelings that go with marital relations that ladies do. A woman wants to know she's loved before she allows a man to touch her that way. A man will touch any willing woman. That's what I mean. Why aren't they more discerning? If word got around that I allowed him to touch me, all the other men would expect the same, but then they wouldn't marry me, because I was tainted. Men are stupid. Esther nodded, willing to agree with anything at that moment, to appease her sister's anger. They can be. Coral sighed. Are there no educated men with manners around here? We talked while you were out with Joseph. We decided to invite the new schoolmaster over for supper. Brody hasn't met him yet, but he's heard good things. If he's the schoolmaster, he must be smart. And presumably, he's not a lecherous old goat. Hopefully, he'll be just perfect for you. You'd do anything to marry me off, wouldn't you? You're choosing him over me. Coral, you're being ridiculous, and you know it. He's my husband. There's no question of who I'll choose. It's my duty to choose his wants and needs over everyone's. Coral nodded, her eyes filled with tears. I know. I just, it's so hard to know I have to marry, and I'm not wanted. You know I want you here. The house is just too small. Maybe we could build a small cabin near the house, and you can come here for meals, but have a different place to stay at night. Coral sniffed, wiping her nose with her apron. It wouldn't be safe. There are too many unmarried men here, and it wouldn't look right. But thank you for thinking of me. They finished the dishes in silence. Esther glanced over her shoulder at Brody, who looked upset by the whole conversation. She wished she knew what to tell him. He had every right not to want her sister there, but her sister had a right to not want to marry just anyone. She felt as if she was caught between a rock and a hard place. Immediately after the dishes were done, Coral flounced away to her room, shutting the door with a distinct snap. Esther walked to sit beside Brody at the table, taking his hand to hold in hers. I'm sorry she was so upset. I don't know what to say to her. 
Brody sighed. I understand. It's got to be hard for her, but it's hard for us as well. I'm not going to force her to marry, but I do wish she could live at the boarding house in Mangled Stump or even live as a maid to someone in Lost Legacy. I don't know how to make it happen, though. I don't either. I really don't know what to do, but I don't want to hurt her feelings, and I don't want to upset you. I feel trapped. I can see that. Hopefully Jackson Smythe is everything she's looking for in a man. He's gotten good reports from the people who send their children to his school. Coral would make a good school teacher. It's too bad there's already one here. She wouldn't be able to live alone though. She'd still need to board with someone. Esther frowned. Where does Mr. Smythe live? He's got a small teacherage right behind the schoolhouse. A man can live alone out here, but a woman really can't. I suppose that's true. I just wish I knew how to make things better for my sister. He brought her hand to his lips, kissing the back of it softly. There are no quick answers. We'll find someone who will suit her perfectly. Someone that she will suit as well. She's a good, capable young lady. There's no reason she can't get married quickly with the number of men we have out here. Esther nodded. Of course not. Are you going to send a message to the teacher? And when will you invite him? I'll go first thing in the morning. School starts at nine, so I'll be at the schoolhouse at quarter, till nine, and he and I will talk. I'm sure he's going to want to meet her. Esther hoped so. She wasn't sure how much longer things could go on as they were. Brody seemed more tense and upset by the day, and Coral was at the end of her rope as well. Asterisk. Brody had a quick talk with Joseph first thing the following morning, before heading to the schoolhouse. Surely the man would understand his predicament and marry his sister-in-law. He briefly considered settling a dowry on her, but that would be ridiculous. That was done with the upper class in England, but it sure wasn't done out west where there weren't enough women. He rode up to the schoolhouse, seeing the smoke coming out of the small building's chimney. Striding into the building, he called the man's name. Smythe? You in here? The teacher was sitting at his desk. I'm right here. How can I help you? I'm Brody Finnegan. I want you to come for dinner tonight. Jackson Smythe's eyes widened with understanding. You're the one who donated the property for the school and my home. I thank you for that. And you'll come to dinner? Brody pressed. Why? Brody sighed. I sent off for a mail-order bride, but she brought her younger sister. My house is too small for a wife and a sister. I need to find a husband for the sister. Oh? Brody studied the other man. He seemed like someone Coral would like. She's real smart, and she knows it. I haven't seen anything she can't do. Her cooking is so good you'll be willing to do anything to marry her once you taste it. Jackson looked at him for a long moment, his dark eyes narrowed in thought. I suppose it won't hurt to meet her. What time? Six. I'll see you then. Brody left the building before the man had time to change his mind. Chapter 9 Esther and Coral worked side by side throughout the following day. Coral was obviously distracted. How can I make you feel better? Esther asked. Coral shrugged. I don't think there's any way. I'm doing my best to find someone, and I don't want you to think that I'm not. I just wish there was an easier way. Like having them send you letters, so you can choose from them? Like the mail-order bride process? Coral laughed. I wonder how men would feel about being chosen that way. I have no idea, but I don't think you'll get anyone to agree to it. Oh, I know. I just wish I could. They had supper in the oven, a cake cooling on the work table, and were sitting at the table darning socks. I hate darning socks, Esther said staring down at the object in her hand. You hate all housework. How did you expect to be a wife and never do any housework? 
Have you seen Jeremiah's house? And mother never did any housework. She was too busy sitting around staring out the window. Esther looked at Coral. Do you know why she did that? Coral made a face. I have an idea, but I'm not sure you really want to know. Esther frowned. Tell me. You know we're only nine months apart. Well, of course. Mother told me you were born early. Father had an affair while mother was pregnant with you. When his mistress became pregnant, he talked mother into pretending the baby was hers. She refused to leave the house during the entire time, not wanting to pretend to be pregnant. When I was born, she accepted me, and truly seemed to love me just as she loved you, but she never wanted to leave the house after that. I can see that. Esther looked at her sister. I always wondered why we look nothing alike. That's why. According to mother, I looked just like the mistress. She was a short, stout, red head, and she was full of vinegar. She said every time she saw me, she was reminded that father had strayed. And she still loved you? Coral laughed. Oh yes. Because she never liked father to begin with. It was a marriage that her parents insisted on, but then they were unhappy with him after they found out about me. But they insisted. They're unreasonable people. I'm so glad we didn't have to move in with them. Neither of us would have been happy there. Esther frowned. But you're not happy here. Coral sighed. No, I'm not. How could I be? You don't need your younger sister living here while you're trying to get to know your new husband. You haven't even consummated because of me. No, but really? I think that's a good thing. I've had time to get to know him better than I would have if we'd had the opportunity to consummate immediately. This is better for us in the long run, whether he realizes it or not. I'm glad you think so. Coral set down the sock she was mending and pulled out a shirt with a missing button. What do you know about this Jackson Smythe? Little more than you do. I suggested last night that we have a party for the neighbors so you could meet the eligible men, rather than him just randomly inviting cowboys over hoping you'd like one. He agreed, but thought we should try the local schoolmaster first. So we are. What does he look like? Brody had never met him when we talked about it. He went to the school today. I do know the schoolhouse and the teacher's house are both on Brody's property because he donated the land. That means you'll be close. Esther reached out across the table to squeeze Coral's hand. I want you to be close. Coral smiled, her eyes sad. I want to be close as well. Who else will teach you how to preserve berries and make jam? Esther laughed. I could certainly buy a book and teach myself to do those things, you know. I do know how to read. I know. But it will be so much more fun to do them together. Yes, it will. Esther sighed. I hope you like this man, but please, if you have any hesitation, don't marry him. I don't want you to be unhappy just to get out of this house. I don't think Brody does either. Yes, we're ready to be alone, but not at your expense. Coral nodded, looking dubious. I won't marry a man unless I think he can be a good husband to me. Good. Brody was home before Jackson arrived, and he took a deep sniff of the air. You ladies are going to make me fat, he announced. Esther rushed to him, kissing his cheek. I'm glad you're home. Tell Coral everything you can about Jackson. Brody washed his hands before going over to sit at the table, watching as his sister-in-law sewed a button onto his shirt. His wardrobe would be tripled if they mended everything that needed it. He seems like a good man. I only met him briefly, and he said he would at least come over to meet you. I didn't have much of a chance to get to know him. I'll be happy to marry him if we suit. Brody nodded. I know it seems like I'm pushing you out but I don't want you to marry a man who wouldn't be a good match for you. Jackson seems like a good man, and he's smart, or he wouldn't be teaching school. 
at least spend some time with him. Coral nodded. I will. And I made one of my favorite desserts, so hopefully he likes sweets. There was a knock on the door, and Coral folded the shirt she was working on before walking over to answer it. The man at the door was of medium height, and he had dark hair and eyes. He held his hat in his hand, but it wasn't a cowboy hat like she was used to the men around there wearing. I'm Jackson Smythe, he said, his voice deep and gravelly. Coral Carruthers. Come in. Esther looked at the young man, just a bit older than she and Coral, and thought he'd do nicely. We're glad you could come. I'm Esther Finnegan. The new name felt strange on her lips. It's nice to meet you, Mrs. Finnegan. Jackson turned back to Coral. I understand you're a good cook. Coral nodded. Very. Jackson took the seat Brody indicated at the table, his eyes never leaving Coral. During the course of the meal, he watched her carefully. Did you cook this? he asked, just before dessert was served. No, my sister cooked the main meal. I baked the cake. It was a gingerbread cake, with whipped cream on top. It smells good, he said, picking up his fork. To Esther, it appeared that he was letting her sister audition for the position of his bride with her baking. She wanted to tell him to get out, but she couldn't. He popped a bite into his mouth, chewing slowly. You are indeed a good cook. I've never had such good gingerbread, and it's always been a favorite of mine. Coral nodded. Mine too. I'm glad you like it. When he finished his last bite, he pushed away from the table. Shall we walk? he asked Coral. She nodded, getting to her feet. I would rather stay close to the house, if you don't mind. Not at all. I wouldn't want it to seem as if we're doing anything improper. He offered her his arm as they left, and the two of them walked away from the house, but stopped close, so they could talk. Esther watched them out the window for a moment until Brody walked up behind her, pulling her back against him. Give them their privacy. Esther turned in her husband's arms, linking her own around his neck. I will. It's hard not to play the protective older sister. I know it is, but I don't think he'll do anything bad. You need to keep an eye on me, though. He lowered his head, kissing her softly. I'm not sure how much longer I can wait. She sighed. I'm not enjoying the wait either. At first, I was happy to have a bit of time to get to know you, but I already know I love you, so waiting seems ridiculous. His eyes met her steadily. You love me? he asked, stroking her cheek. She nodded. Yes, I'm not sure how it happened, but I've known from the instant I met you that I was more attracted to you than I was to my old fiancé. I never would have been truly happy with him, but I can be with you. You're even worth doing household chores for. I knew the instant I saw you that you were the wife I'd been waiting for. He leaned down kissing her again, more passionately this time. I just wish it wasn't so difficult. She rested her head on his shoulder, wishing with everything inside her that her sister would find her match. The door opened a moment later with Coral and Jackson, standing calmly together. We've decided to marry, Jackson announced. It's Friday, so we're going to drive into Lost Legacy, to do it this weekend. Esther's eyes widened. What about waiting until you're 18? Coral shrugged. We've decided not to. What does two months matter? I, I don't think that's a good idea. I do, Brody said. If they will suit, why would they wait? Truthfully, he wasn't thinking only of his need to bet his wife. If his young sister-in-law would be happy with the man, it made sense to him for them to marry right away. What about school on Monday? The drive takes a day and a half each way. We'll leave before sun up and get it done in a day. My buggy is faster than a wagon anyway. You can't stay overnight alone on the way there. We won't be. We'll leave before sunrise and get there early enough for the pastor to marry us. But, I'm not ready. 
Esther knew her protest made no sense. The men had decided it was all right. No matter how she felt, Esther knew she would be outvoted. Coral took her sister's hands in hers. This is for the best for all of us. Jackson and I will suit well, and there won't be any more delays. Esther hugged her sister close. All right. Her eyes met Jackson's. Be good to my sister. He nodded. I will. I'll be here at four. We'll take turns driving, so we can both stay awake. Jackson closed the door behind him, leaving Esther feeling empty inside. She knew Coral wouldn't be marrying him so quickly if not for the situation they found themselves in. Coral smiled. Let's do the dishes, so we can go to sleep early. I'm getting married tomorrow. Go to bed, Coral. I'll do the dishes. Coral seemed torn for a moment, but then she nodded. I'll go to sleep then. She walked into the small room she'd been sharing with Esther. Esther looked at Brody. I wish there was a way to stop them. There's not. She's of a legal age to marry, and so is he. They're not doing anything wrong. I know that. I just, it doesn't seem right. But it is. Brody wasn't sure whether he should rejoice in the fact he would finally get a wedding night or worry about his new sister-in-law. He had to have faith, though. He opened his arms to her, and she ran to him, clinging. I'm going to miss her. I know you will, but she'll be in good hands. There's no need for you to worry. I suppose not. Esther was in a situation better than she'd dreamed she would be six weeks before, when she'd heard of her father's crime. At least her sister would be close, and she could be certain she was all right. We're finally going to be able to start our marriage, he said, stroking her cheek. We have a right to be happy. Esther rested her head on his shoulder. We will be. I'll just be sure to watch over my sister as much as I can. I'll be beside you. If she needs a place to stay, our home will always be open to her. He forced himself to say the words, knowing they would make her feel better. Esther sighed. She's going to be all right. She walked over to finish the dishes, confident that Coral could take care of herself. She had a man who loved her. Yes, she was still a little worried about her sister, but she had the right to be happy in her own situation. Tonight would be the last night for her to sleep in the spare bedroom. Soon she would have the man she loved all to herself. Epilogue Esther stared down at the baby in her arms, thinking back over the last year of her life, a year she'd expected to go so very differently than it had. Montana had been a good place for her and for Coral. Brody was so much better for her than Jeremiah ever could have been. In fact, she'd received a letter from an old friend recently about how Jeremiah had married another young woman, and it was all over town they were having trouble getting along. Now, Esther didn't let herself gloat about her former fiancé's difficult marriage, much. Sometimes she simply couldn't help herself. Looking back down at the little boy in her arms, she stroked his cheek, and he wrinkled his nose in protest. Brody leaned over and smiled at the boy. He's perfect. Thank you for giving me a son. Esther beamed as she looked at her husband. I wanted a son for you, at least this first time. I'd have been happy with either one, but I'm happy I'll have a son to help me fight off bows when the girls do come. Throughout her pregnancy, he'd had nightmares of having a beautiful daughter, and with a wife like Esther, how could he have anything else? Esther laughed. We'll teach them from when they're young to choose a man just like their daddy. He laughed. We can try. He wrapped his arm around her shoulders, dropping a kiss atop her head. I'm so glad you were the one to answer my letter. I can't imagine spending my life with anyone else. She turned and brushed his lips with hers. Being with you makes me very happy, and now I feel like our lives are complete. He'll mean so much more work, but thankfully, Coral and I can do much of it together. Yes. She'll be a good aunt to David. 
Coral still made him crazy at times with her know-it-all attitude, but she was no longer under his roof, and having her close made Esther happy. Esther sighed, imagining the days and years to come. She had everything she needed right there in her little house, 